Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to go ahead and get started. It's uh, 1030, so I want to welcome you all here. Uh, my name is Lisa Bachman, and I'm helping facilitate putting on these meetings and also keeping you informed along the way uh, through newsletters and through uh, all the information on the website. So in a minute, we'll do introductions of the rest of the team, but I want to thank you for taking your Saturday, especially, to be here for this. This is the planning and design process underway for the Robeson Arena on Colorado College, which is scheduled to be the... Uh, the home of Colorado College uh, CC Tiger Hockey and also uh, City for Champions events. So uh, just a couple of quick housekeeping items. We have restrooms out, out um, on each side, down below and up above. Uh, we've got refreshments down at the lower level. Help yourself to those. Uh, please silence your cell phones. And I want to mention at our last meeting, which was a workshop over at Tut Library, uh, one of our participants left us keys there. Uh, if anyone found any keys after the workshop that aren't yours, if you could just turn them in at, uh, either to me or one of the uh, folks down at the sign-in table, we would appreciate that. So um, what I'd like to do now is review the agenda. Uh, so this is our agenda for today's meeting, and um, I'll go through the introductions of the project team quickly, and then we'll spend about 20 minutes talking about what we've heard to date through all of these meetings. We have scheduled through this process three public meetings. That's this, this forum here at Cornerstone, and then two workshops. The first one took place January 19th at the Tut Library, and the second one is coming up. We'll talk about that in a minute as well. And then we'll spend another 20 minutes and we'll address the, uh, the arena program. So what does that program look like in terms of the use and the different events, Colorado College ice hockey events and the City for Champion events. Then we'll take about 20 minutes and we'll talk about the architecture. So what is the building going to look like? What's that fan experience going to be? And the architect is here and we'll be covering that. And then we'll have another 20 minutes where we will do questions and answers. And uh, again, we have microphones set up and we'll ask you to go to the microphones versus um, yelling the questions out for your seat. We do ask your respect to let the team get all the way through the presentation and then line up for the, the questions. That way we can get as many people in with questions as possible. All right, so project team. I'd like to introduce with a show of hands, we've got here from the college, Chris Coulter. Chris is the Assistant Vice President of Facility Services. We have Rick Green down here in the front, Senior Project Manager. We have Scott Lowenberg. Scott is the Associate Athletic Director. And then from the City of Colorado Springs Economic Development, we have Bob Cope. Bob is down here in the front. And then the consultant project team, we've got Chris Lieber. Chris is with NES, the land planning urban design firm uh, from Colorado Springs, who is leading the consultant effort on the design and planning. <laughs> uh, myself, Lisa Bachman, and also with me, I have Allison Tao, Monica Ramey, and Cassandra Aquino, all helping just all the logistics and facilitation of these meetings. We have the architect, Adam Davidson, is here. Adam is with JLG Architects, which is um, 100 Architects, 30-year-old company, and in from balmy North Dakota. <laughs> uh, for traffic and parking, we have Todd Frisbee here. <clears throat> Todd is with the firm of Felsberg Holt Ulvig FHU, and they are the uh, traffic and the uh, transportation engineers for the project. And civil engineer, we have Kyle Campbell with Classic Engineering. I don't believe. Kyle is here today. Kyle's a local um, engineering land development firm handling, uh, handling residential, commercial, and recreation projects. That is our, our team. Uh, upcoming meetings. So today is February 16th. This is the second community meeting, public meeting. And then on March 2nd, we'll have the next breakout workshop meeting over at Tut Library. And the focus of that will be on the site plan and more on the parking. Um, and then we have another community meeting back here again on, in April, but we've not set that date yet. And then it goes to the downtown review board. Uh, you'll notice we had originally June, the schedule slipped just a little bit. So we're now looking at July for that. And then the presentation to city council, that also we're now looking at August for that meeting. So I wanted to point that out. Um, 
We have a project website set up and we've been videotaping all these meetings. Videotape people are here today as well. Uh, and we're also taking notes of all these meetings. So if you haven't had the opportunity to attend the prior meetings or the future, you can go online and see the meeting uh, through the videotape and look at the summaries, look at the photos, look at the PowerPoint, everything from these meetings are posted up there, as well as the frequently asked questions are posted there. Um, so we encourage you to do that. Um, so let me, let me ask, just got a sense, how many people here were at the last big meeting here in this room? Awesome, so it looks like about, I'm gonna guess about 75%. And how many were at the workshop at Tut Library? About, about the same, so that's great. So we have a few new folks. Um, again, if you wanna go back and look at what was, uh, took place in the summary from the workshop and the prior meeting, you can do that on the website. So uh, again, we encourage you to do that. Um, couple things I wanna mention on that website. We have a frequently asked questions along with all the other documents. If you, if you have time, go to those and, and check those out. We'll try to keep those updated as quickly as we can. There's been a lot of misinformation that I've been seeing out on social media, inaccurate information, and uh, tends to get legs and get circulated. Uh, but we do encourage you to go to the website because that's where all the actual uh, factual information is located. And feel free to share any and all of that um, as often as you'd like. So we appreciate your help on that. Um, let's see, I think before I introduce Chris Coulter from the college, I just want to mention that through these meetings we're incorporating what we're hearing, aspects of what we're hearing. In a minute we're going to go through that. We're going to put, put back out to you those things that we've been hearing at the meetings. Um, it is an iterative process though. So. We don't have all the answers yet. The team is working hard to incorporate and move the process forward. So um, I just want to point that out. We are, we are addressing what we're hearing over, over the course of the project. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and introduce Chris Coulter from the college. Thank you, Lisa. Good morning, everybody. Uh, good morning and welcome. Uh, it is a pleasure to see all of you, and we look forward to a productive morning together. If we could hit that one. Okay. My name is Chris Coulter, and I am the Associate Vice President of Facility Services here at Colorado College. On the screen behind me, uh, you will see five ropes and arena project delivery principles listed using verbs like Connecting, elevating, establishing, and creating. Words describing what the college seeks to deliver, including our fundamental aim of making Ropes and Arena a destination that enhances the fabric of our community. The college has embarked upon a public process to both demonstrate accountability and dignify thoughtful input. Today is an opportunity to balance and verify what we have heard to date while opening the door to what we might see moving forward. I hope and trust that what you will see today will further buttress the college's public process goal of dignifying those conversations we have heard and had thus far. During upcoming workshops and community meetings, the college will continue to engage the public and traffic opportunity, thoughtfully demonstrating the art of compromise. We very much look forward to your feedback and comments throughout the process. Today marks an exciting new conversation and begins to move the project needle toward what we believe will be a welcomed outcome. I now want to invite Lisa back to the stage and we'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Lisa. Great, thanks Chris. Um, so what we're going to do now, as I mentioned, is get into the what we've heard so far. Um, and this has come from the prior meetings and also the emails and uh, text messages that we've received. We've been pulling all that together. We've tried to solidify it, boil it down into the topics so that we don't have to put you through you know, a gazillion pages of, of feedback. Um, 
We've always said that this meeting today was going to focus on the architecture and the building. So that's what we'll be doing in a little bit. And then as Chris said, we're going to circle back at the next workshop and talk more about the site plan and about the parking and traffic. So don't give up on us. If you still want to focus on the parking and the traffic, the next workshop is really going to dive back into that again. Uh, but today it's the building and the architecture. So. Um, Report out what you're going to hear in a minute is from the January 19th workshop. We had small group exercises and we had over 120 people attend and break out into small groups. The feedback you have here is not necessarily consensus from everybody at the table, but it was their general, this is what we want to put forward when they did the report out of what their table came away with in terms of recommendations and um, solutions. Um, Again, today's topic, again, we're going to focus on the events, the activities, and also uh, both C4C and, and the uh, hockey. So with that, I'm going to invite Todd Frisbee to come back up, and he is going to talk about what we've heard so far from the standpoint of the parking and the traffic. Okay, Todd, I'm Todd Frisbee with uh, Felsberg Holt and Ulvid. Um, you see my face up here talking about parking and traffic. Uh, and I don't have much, as Lisa said, much new to report other than uh, we have heard, uh, these are a summary of comments and statements that we've heard regarded, regarding parking uh, and traffic. And so uh, we've heard folks say, hey, park, park as many as close to the arena um, as possible. Expand, you know, have the, you know, have the college take a look at expanding lots, um, either through surface efforts or through garages. Uh, and we've given, been given different ideas on how to do that. Uh, minimize on-street parking, what, was, what uh, the comment sort of was not to, related to that was, let's not rely uh, too heavily on on-street parking to meet the, uh, meet the parking uh, demand. And then related to that is minimize parking impacts to residences and businesses. And so these are a couple tools that have been, we've suggested and also that the, the groups have been uh, have reiterated back to us about residential parking permits, you know, using the downtown um, shuttle, or using the downtown garages and the shuttles uh, related to that. Uh, and, then, uh, and then use nearby surface lots. You know, college is already looking at uh, partnerships with those who have commercial lots who could be available uh, for uh, parking. And then traffic as well. Uh, parking and traffic are related. Uh, um, it's where you park people is where the traffic is going to be and so one of the things that uh, we're still working on and we're not ready to, to finish up yet is a parking and traffic study. Uh, we will be doing that but we need to figure out what the parking is going to be first uh, so we know where the traffic is going uh, to be. So I'll, once that parking plan is sort of solidified and, and begins to become more clear, uh, we'll begin to work, look at the traffic and the impacts related to events um, related to uh, hockey events at the arena. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Scott, and he's going to talk about user experience. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Um, I'm Scott Lohenberg, and I'm in the athletic department at Colorado College. And we've received a lot of great feedback on this arena. And I can tell you that uh, myself and my staff and those on, on campus, we're thinking about this arena every single day and we're strategizing and planning for this arena and we're very excited about it and we thank you for your feedback. But uh, some of the things we've heard about user experience is to you know, consider what, what kind of experience you're gonna have for D1 hockey, which is what Colorado College is. You know, a lot of people have been to other events around the country, they've been to World Arena events, Pepsi Center events. You know, a lot of people have talked about you know, HD scoreboards and you know, what, what the experience is going to be like walking to the arena, being inside the arena, and, you know, the fan experience and the team experience. So we're definitely working on that. Uh, season ticket holders and priority parking passes, that's definitely things we are, that is important to us as well. And we are working on, on those kinds of things with the campus, on getting designated lots and having enough of them uh, to where we can take care of our, our fans that are coming to the games. Season ticket holders access to season tickets. We have said that, it, that is guaranteed. So if there's anybody that hasn't been to a prior meeting, that's for sure. If you're a season ticket holder right now, and we even have some more available, but if you're a season ticket holder, uh, you are gonna be guaranteed access to purchase season tickets in the new ropes and arena. And we've had people ask about chair back seats and cup holders and Wi-Fi access. We are gonna have all of that. Uh, it's not, uh, 
we're planning on this arena being, from a fan standpoint, better than the World Arena. It's just going to be smaller. You know? um, easy access for parking to minimize game attendees driving around, that's for sure as well. So that's, again, as we get lots on campus and designate our season ticket holders to certain lots on campus, uh, even some of the lots we're going to get nearby, like from the uh, Methodist Church and some of those, we're going to have, we're going to do traffic control, and that's what we're working with Todd with, so people aren't, you know, com you know driving into each other and driving into p pedestrians. It, you know, we're going to work on a strategy for that, and we are thinking about those kinds of things. Uh, and again, walking around in the neighborhood, again, that's very important to us. You know, college, you walk around the college campus, we're going to have an event on that night, that's, that's something we're going to plan on, and in, e ingress and egress for traffic safety, we are, again, going to work with uh, our campus public safety and the Colorado Springs Police Department, and uh, we are going to come up with a strategy for that. And I guess I've already talked about the uh, having a lot for season ticket holders. The aesthetics, architecture, and neighborhood context, that some of the feedback we've received is, you know, to consider an alternative location for the arena, and we have. We've actually, you know, we're, we're looking at that. Uh, we're even looking at uh, some things right now on campus about that. So make sure any parking garages look nice and fit in with campus. Again, if you know Colorado College, that's, that's a big priority for the college. Anything that uh, we build is, is going to fit in in, in, the, in the college architecture. It's going to fit in the community, and that's, that's important to the college. Uh, historic pre preservation, that goes along with that as well. Uh, concerns about building height, again. That's a, that's a concern for the college as well, and we are concerned about uh, your feedback is we're not looking to, again, this is not going to be a world arena on campus. This is going to be a much smaller arena, and it's not going to be uh, extremely high as well to where uh, you're going to say, what the heck is this big, huge building on campus? So it's, it's going to fit in. It's going to be nice. Um, Interest to locations to the arena need to be well designed. That's, that's a great feedback and, and something we're considering and you'll hear from our, our architect here a little bit later. Uh, some people have asked about NHL size rink. Uh, we are planning on that. That's actually the World Arena is the last Olympic ice sheet built in North America. Uh, that's kind of something from the past and everything now is all NHL ice sheets. Even Olympic events, when you see the speed skating and the figure skating, they all want NHL ice, ice sheets. And that's what's best for Colorado College in terms of recruiting and, and doing what's best for our program. I don't know if you knew this, but all NCA tournament events, they have to be on an NHL ice sheet. None of them are on Olympic ice sheets anymore, so that's important to us as well. Capacity of the arena, we've, we've heard a ton of feedback about that. I think that's probably the biggest thing along with parking, uh, too big or too small. And you know, right now we're looking at that. 3,000 to 3,650 kind of range, and you know we, we see it as a as a good sweet spot, and uh, we're we're excited about that. And concerns about uh, neighborhood businesses and organizations, uh, we've actually listed a couple. We've we've been reached to the people that have contacted us, and even some people that haven't contacted us. We've reached out to our community neighbors and our businesses, and we've actually contacted a couple of those specifically. Um, so that is happening. Some things about events that's good to know is in this arena, you're going to have your uh, Colorado College hockey games, you're going to have practice, and then you're going to have a lot of the daily and weekly events and programs. And the way you can kind of envision that, and, I'll, and it's even a little bit more detail in the next slide, is basically what's happening is we're, we're, what's happening at Hone and Ice Arena right now is going to happen in the new arena as well. And the only thing we're really adding is Colorado College Tiger varsity hockey and then the C4C events that we'll work with the sports authority on. So, for example, this weekend, I don't know how many of you know it, but there's a President's Day tournament going on right now where people are here from Texas and Arizona and California, like all over the country, and they're here with their little youth teams, and they're staying in hotels, and they're spending money on restaurants, and you know, they're buying groceries for their, you know, getting kids bagels and, and granola, granola bars and all that. That's a, that's a kind of event we'll have for C4C, and that's, that's something that's uh, happening this weekend at Honan, and, and we'll plan on continuing to happen. And a I know Bob's going to talk a little bit more on detail on C4C type events here in a little bit. So in terms of the events and activities, this is just a little bit more detailed. You know, I've, I've said it before, but if you haven't been here, when you envision Colorado College hockey games, 
we're going to have anywhere from 18 to 23 home games. So 23 is going to be the maximum out of a 365-day-year calendar. Um, even really, you know, we all want to host playoffs, and, and that's important to our program. But really and truly, uh, most years, it's going to be 18 games. We just wanted to let you know that it could be up to 23. There's the attendance numbers. Um, it's good to see the student numbers because... Uh, students obviously aren't going to be driving around the neighborhood and aren't going to be, you know, worried about parking. They're just going to be walking to the event. Um, and there's the Division, you know, one ice time. And then there's a lot of the events that we host right now at Honan that we are planning on continuing and scheduling and keeping those events going. And at this time, I'll introduce Bob Cope from the City of Colorado Springs. Thank you, Scott, and good morning. Uh, today I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, Colorado Springs Sports Authority, uh, which we really haven't spent a lot of time on up to date, and then I'll go into a little more detail on some of the uh, City for Champions uh, events. Uh, the, uh, as most of you know, this is a City for Champions project. It's part of the four uh, projects that were approved by the state of Colorado uh, back in uh, 2013. Uh, the uh, United States Olympic Museum, the William J. Hill Sports Medicine Performance Center, uh, United States Air Force Academy Visitor Center, and a fourth element, the uh, Colorado Sports and Events Center, which was to include an indoor venue and an outdoor venue. So Rope Center Arena will be the uh, indoor venue for the Colorado Sports and Events Center. And when that, at that time, what the state was looking at, they obviously wanted to create uh, economic growth and opportunity for the cities where these projects were approved. But what they were really focusing on was net new out-of-state uh, visitors that would generate new revenue for the state that would then, they could use some of that money to help fund these projects because they didn't have money in the general fund just like the city doesn't. But if they could generate new revenue, they could invest that new revenue uh, into these projects. So. It was, uh, the process was, as we described these venues that we were going to build, then we had an economist say, uh, if you build these types of venues, this is how much revenue you generate, and that's where the $120 million uh, came from. So when we were approved, uh, the state said, okay, you build these venues, you can uh, use the, uh, the dedicated revenue, but we want to make sure that you build them and operate them the way you said you were going to. So as part of the resolution that documented, documented the state's approval, uh, they required the city to form an entity to oversee the construction and operation of these venues. So we are in the process of forming the Colorado Springs Sports Authority. And the, the sole purpose really is to make sure that these are constructed uh, in accordance with the resolution, so size, seating, components, um, that sort of thing. And then after they're built and constructed, that we follow the business plan that was submitted to the state. So that's really uh, the purpose. Uh, the way the authority is set up is there'll be five members. Uh, there'll be a mayor appointee. Uh, CC will have an appointee. Uh, the Colorado Springs Switchbacks will have an appointee. Since they are going to be the operators of the outdoor venue, uh, Widener Stadium, which is uh, married to this project. Uh, then we'll have a city council appointee and a county commissioner appointee. So uh, obviously there'll be a lot of work up front um, uh, assuring uh, that the projects are built uh, in accordance with the resolution. But then ongoing after that, the authority will work in a very collaborative project, uh, process with uh, CC, with the Color Spring Switchbacks, and with our existing ecosystem that we already have, our sports ecosystem, that does this now every day, day in and day out, with the uh, uh, the Sports Corporation and the Convention and Visitors Bureau, um, the USOC Training Center, they're, they're constantly uh, working to program uh, these types of events. Uh, the uh, <laughs> CC will have dedicated staff to programming the uh, ropes and arena, and uh, the switchbacks will also have dedicated staff. The switchbacks have also agreed to uh, uh, establish a single point of contact uh, for programming the venue. Uh, so I'll have a person, I'll have a website uh, where if someone's interested in booking events at either venue, they would have that, that single uh, point of contact. Uh, but in the end, CC will be operating and will make final decisions on programming ropes and arena, and the Colorado Springs switchbacks 
uh, will make final decisions and they will uh, operate the uh, Widener Stadium. So I won't go through and uh, read all these potential partners that we have uh, for both the indoor and outdoor venue, but really there's an endless number of partners. We uh, have more than half of the national governing bodies for the uh, Olympic movement located in Colorado Springs. Uh, and we're also home to a lot of amateur uh, sporting events. But beyond that, uh, these venues lend themselves to community events uh, that would engage uh, ordinary citizens uh, day in and day out. And then just to give a, a little more uh, insight into what these projects more, might look like. So a tier one event might be one of the larger events. And the business plan, I think we call them marquee events. And those when we're really going to try to attract uh, uh, large scale events with a large number of participants, because that's where the net new out-of-state visitors come from, but also that would have interest in, and uh, draw a lot of spectators. You know, early on, we don't expect to, uh, uh, to attract a lot of the marquee or tier one events, but over the long run, that is definitely uh, part of the business plan. And when that would happen, then obviously there'd be uh, significant coordination with uh, Colorado College. Uh, it would be based on availability, scheduling, it would be done way out in advance, and if it were one of the larger events that would be comparable to a CC hockey game, then all the planning and preparation would have to happen, including uh, a parking plan and uh, parking analysis. Then there'd be t uh, tier two events would be medium size, where you'd have uh, hopefully a large number of participants, probably not many spectators, and then the tier one events that could be uh, they could be sports camps, they could be uh, any type of a, maybe a regional competition for uh, one of the NGBs probably wouldn't draw a lot of spectators, but you'd have coaches, family, trainers, uh, and that sort of thing. A couple of points I'd like to make about, uh, about these events. Some of these events will occur over multiple days, and uh, you wouldn't expect the participants or even the spectators to be there for a two or a three day event. They would, they would come when, uh, when their relative, their friend, their uh, athlete that they're working with was competing, and then they would probably rotate out of, the, out of the venue. If it were an elimination, they might come back if it was a bracketed system, uh, but you're not gonna have all of the attendees that, uh, that we're estimating in the venue uh, at one time. Uh, also, about a third of the total uh, attendants are made up of the participants, coaches, trainers, uh, and, and that sort of thing. And the peak time attendance, again, just to reiterate that, uh, the peak time attendance will be significantly less than the total attendance, attendance just because um, it, participants and spectators will be uh, cycling in and out of the venue. And also, based on the coordination we're doing with CC, events will only be during uh, summer block breaks, holidays, and most frequently on weekends. So we think it's going to be easily, uh, easily manageable. So I hope that gives you a little more insight in uh, the Sports Authority, its oversight, how it works with this project, and what these C4C events uh, might look like. And with that, I would like to uh, uh, invite Adam Davidson uh, with the uh, architectural team to come up and talk about uh, the specifics of the venue. Can you hear me? No. No. Okay, I like to move around a lot, so that's why I like to have this little thing here, so for good, excellent, so thanks, Bob, appreciate it. Good morning, everybody. Uh, happy to be here, especially as Lisa put it, it's a balmy negative eight when I left North Dakota this morning, so it's really nice being here in this weather. Um, what I want to start off with today in the architecture is how we begin. Excuse me? Yes. I want to ask if you could speak a little more slowly. Yeah. Sure. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Okay. No problem. Okay. No problem. Yeah. We'll do. I want to begin with the design narrative. So when we begin a project, um, there's always a pragmatic elements as budget and scope and schedule, all very important that goes along with it. But one of the first things we want to do is develop the narrative. What's the identity going to be like? What's the story? going to be told with this project. There are three main goals that came out of our first discussions with the college. One was going to be, how can we elevate the Tiger hockey program to a national level, a recruiting advantage for the program. 
Number two is how can we increase energy efficiency in the building to a point where we consume no more than we produce, net zero. And the third one, which is one I think is very important, is to create a sense of place. Not only for Tiger Hockey, but also for the greater CC community, and I think also the greater CS community as well. And how can we create a sense of place for all three of those to successfully work and balance? And so when we did that, we started to put together this narrative of what that is, a lot of adjectives and everything there, to develop this story, the entity of the building, the identity of the building. In addition to, I think it's very important to take a look at the surrounding site context, topography, the, I'm sorry. I'm sorry? They can't hear you. We can't hear you. It's not on her. Is that better? Yeah. Okay, I'll hold it here, guys. Sorry about that. I'll try to use this here so that it works a little better for y'all. So, no problem. So, again, uh, talking about the topography, the site context, how oh, that's very important that we look at a building. How does the building adapt to that? How can we take cues from that? So as a kind of a, what we call a party or a, an idea image of what that could be is looking at the surrounding context, the topography, the layering of the surrounding mountains and how we can approach that with the building to do the same thing in a similar manner. Um, not really biomimicry, but in a similar fashion to really take cue from the site and to develop the building in such a form. So with that, I'm gonna jump into the floor plans. Um, right now, as you kind of heard before, the site selection is kind of going back and forth. We're reviewing some alternate options to how the building can be placed on site. So I'm not going to get into how that's going to work, but as it affects the building program spaces, um, these will still function very similar what I'm going to go through here right now. Um, the entry sequence, um, the team suite for the hockey program, uh, other amenities of the hockey program as well, and the, just the, the how you use the facility. So to begin, this building is approximately, as of now, and we're still going through the early stages of design, about 115,000 square feet on three levels. There's an event level, which is where you'll enter. There's a concourse level, where you'll elevate up to and get to your seats. And there's going to be a suite and club level. That'll be up there for press, uh, suites, and premium seating for the club spaces. As the building is situated right now, on this image right here, north is going to be up. So Tejon is going to be over here on the west, and then we'll have Dale Street down here along the south. The entry sequence is extremely important in how this connects to the campus and how this connects to the exterior plazas. So when you approach the building, it's really got to have this inviting, visible um, sequence to it. It's got to get you excited. It's got to do a lot of things. And so the lobby and the main entrance to the facility is going to be an extension of the campus, an extension of the plaza. Very important to bring that in. As you approach that, it's going to be a very open, flexible space. A grand stair up to the concourse, a large enough to hold events, different type of special occasions. So it can function more than just on hockey game day. It can also function for other events at other times, whether it be a lecture series. A lot of times in arenas that we see are going to be uh, wedding receptions or any type of event. So it can be a multi-purpose type space. So it's very important that we size it and we really look at it as a daylit filled grand space. In addition to that, there's also an amenity of a pro shop. And what I'm talking about, there's ticketing, there's skate rental, there's intramural club office, there's going to be the team store. And it's highly visible and it's right out front. And so there's that engagement between the lobby space and the entry sequence to these services. In addition to the multifunctional use of the facility, not just for um, Tiger Hockey, but also for club and hockey and intramural teams, is to have easy access to the ice level going past the pro shop. So the pro shop is doing a lot of things here and engaging on game day and engaging the lobby, also engaging Tejon on non-game days for the team store and retail aspect of it, but also engaging the event level as well to bring people in in a very easy, secure way to rent skates for any type of open skate or to use the, um, the uh, locker rooms, which are down here in blue, for any type of club team, intramural team. So that connection is very important. Um, along with that, we're gonna have some administration uh, program space in here, so we're talking about offices and conference space. This is gonna be the business administration for a little bit of athletics and for the arena. Um, important for them to have access directly off to home for not actually going through the arena, but also having access back to the arena so that they can do what they need to do on game days or just uh, normal operations throughout the facility. In addition to, we are looking at additional retail component as well. Um, getting back to that sense of place, 
activating Tejon, activating the site in a way that brings people there, pedestrians, plazas and landscape places, retail, restaurants, is gonna be a very important aspect of this project so that we're addressing the neighborhood and the community as well. So not just on game days are people gonna be activating the space, it's gonna be all the time, 24 seven is a possibility with having some of those amenities there. So working on that as well with some of those spaces. Or they could also be spaces to support the college and the arts program, we've talked about that as well too. So having those types of spaces as well to really activate that space. The sense of place for the hockey program is really important for a D1 program to have a, I don't want to say it's isolated, but it needs to be a separate hockey only space, a team suite. To compete at that level, it's got to be a space that is just for hockey. The training, the video, the lockers, heavily branded. It has to have that hockey history, that tradition. And that's a recruiting advantage you see. So you get all the other big programs around the country, whether it be Denver or St. Cloud or where I come from, University of North Dakota, this is a big deal. And that's the sense of place we're trying to create for the hockey program, is to get that advantage, that recruiting advantage to build up for multiple national championships in that level. So what you see here is a facility that has access for a team administration, so I'm talking about coach's office, conference room, a little waiting area, that you can get to either off the lobby or probably off the backside here. And then that really serves some of those administration functions for the team. It also it starts the recruiting path for your recruits. That's also very important. When you bring recruits in here, the first thing they're going to see is what they're going to remember a little bit. So you really want to make that a wow factor. And so the idea about doing this is bring them in through a very grand entrance lobby that I had talked about, through the team administration, and then they take a recruiting path, as we call it, through the team space. And what we see there is going to be a lot of different functions. There's going to be a training room and a hydrotherapy room, a video room for watching tape, an open lounge area for um, snacking, for you know, other type of lounge activities between practices or between other type of events. There's also a heavily branded wet locker, and there's two types of lockers in a facility like this, a dry locker and a wet locker. Purpose is you come in as a player, and you take off you know, your street clothes, dry locker, you go to your wet locker, and that's really the heavily branded area of that wet locker area. On top of that, you're gonna have uh, equipment storage and laundry, and at the very far end, just because of kind of noise and impact, we'll have the weight room and the training area. So fitness, weights, cardio, and all that stuff. But it's completely separated <coughs> from the rest of the event corridor with a heavily branded tradition approach to Tiger hockey. And that's what really sells to a lot of students these days. Whether it be hockey or football or other programs, the branding is really a huge recruiting advantage. The spaces that you have is a huge recruiting advantage. And that's what we're aiming to do here with this space right here. That's the sense of place we're trying to create. Along with the arena itself, the, the hockey play experience, but also for the team experience is right there. Everything else in this level is probably gonna be utility, mechanical, or storage focused. So everything in brown that you see here is gonna be geared towards mechanical, the ice plant, uh, other mechanical spaces, uh, storage spaces for events, and things of that nature. Once again, the blue was gonna be the locker support spaces for club teams and other tournaments and things of that nature. Uh, there is a visiting team locker room for the visiting varsity team that comes here as well. And that makes up the primary uh, footprint of the event level. This is at grade. At this time, we're not sinking the building. We're going to keep it at grade, and there's a lot of reasons why we do that. Um, and we can talk about that later as well. This is the concourse level. So the concourse level, the way we've developed this, which we feel is very successful for arena this size, is what's called an open concourse level. A lot of times you get to big arenas, you have the vault entrances and the concourse on the backside, and a lot of your support spaces are there, so you don't get that view back, and you're actually walking around the backside. Well, our intent here is to keep that open, so no matter where you are in the concourse, around the facility, you have a view of the game. You're always in the action. It really opens it up and makes the game feel bigger than it is. Another thing that we're doing, too, with the bowl itself is we're increasing the angle of the seating. And the reason why we do this is that it creates the effect that you're on top of the ice. Successful arenas and hockey programs, as you go around, especially the older ones, are so compact and they're right on top of the ice that you really get that action. You really get that uh, atmosphere that programs love, coaches love. It's an advantage. It's another recruiting advantage, but it's also an advantage for the program itself. And so we really want to make this facility fill up, feel like you're on top of it, just to get that energy going. And that's why a arena this size does a lot better than an arena bigger because you can create that atmosphere with this bowl. In addition to that, I want to point over to the lobby again. Again, we're really trying to create 
that dynamic entrance point. It's a really good multifunctional space, but really that wow factor when you walk in. It needs to be really celebrating that. One thing that we're trying to do, which is interesting with this, and we don't see a lot in hockey arenas, is we're trying to introduce multi-purpose spaces. Again, it goes back to our project goals of the sense of place for the community, for the CC community. How can we develop the program to have multifunctional spaces, such as this right here I'm highlighting in red, off the lobby, an extension of the lobby, that on game days could be like a nice social atmosphere, because we see that a lot now with hockey programs and other sport programs. People are there sometimes more for the social aspect of it, not necessarily for the game. And so having spaces for that to support that will bring people there. And so on game day, this could be a little social club area, high top tables, spills out to the outdoor patio. And again, this is west. And we're about, at this point, we're probably about 20 feet up in the air. All over here, you'll see Pikes Peak in the mountains. And so that game day experience really gets accentuated with having these types of spaces. However, though, during a week, uh, it could be a student athlete study space. Uh, we could have a special classroom or lecture series there. It's going to be an accessible space. It's going to be an extension. So it's a place that you can say, I can go to. It's not going to be inclusive or exclusive or inclusive just the hockey program. It's going to be inclusive to all. It's something we don't normally see in hockey programs or hockey facilities like this. It's usually always hockey focused. A lot of these spaces, we're trying to make a broader sense of place with other focuses, not just on hockey. But each one can be successful. In addition to that, you're going to see a lot of the amenities on the concourse level, uh, restrooms. A lot of this is code-driven just due to the capacity of the arena. But the location of the restrooms are very important, and we are not trying to space them out. Dispersion is very important to make sure that we have enough in the corner so that no matter where you're sitting, you're not too far away. And when we try to compact the building to make sure we keep square footage down, that's something we always got to keep a, a mindful of thing on is making sure that we have the distances set apart and we're not getting that... Uh, uh, too far, so something we continually work on. Concessions, over here in red, over here in red. Guest services and first aid, typical services and amenities we see at a concourse level to support the operation. Uh, of course, we'll have some mechanical spaces up here as well to support that. And then again, just the open concourse around here. With the concourse corners and actually some of these spaces in between here, as you'll see between the structural systems, uh, we like to look at mobile food carts to give a variety of different things that you can do there. Could be a satellite team store, could be a different, uh, another food cart of a variety of uh, different types of cuisine. So it really just gives a, a nice amenity to um, what you can do there um, from a fan standpoint and really elevates that game day experience. Uh, the views are very important again, so we're really trying to maximize the views out the west and you can see we're still developing this guy right here, which I'll be honest with you, is really an eyesore for us on the west side, so we're trying to develop how we can work that because What's really unique about this, what you're seeing more in hockey facilities, mainly in Canada, is a lot more daylighting. Old hockey facilities were just a box. No windows at all, hard thing, just a box. It was a pretty exciting atmosphere, but what we're seeing now with the experience of part of it is to bring some daylight in, some glazing in. And with your situation, the site, and again, back to the, the, the topography, there is a huge opportunity to take advantage of that and really make this a top-notch facility and bring those views in. Now, one thing, because of the net zero approach is we're definitely looking at glazing locations and we're very specific about glazing percentages and where that goes. West is always not a good orientation for that, but it's something we'll be working through to make sure that we get the balance of both. And then here's the third level. This is the suite club level. So up here, we're going to have six suites. We'll have the press area, which is usually centered right here for the camera on center ice. And then we have two club spaces over here. This would be kind of premium club space seating, so a ticket would be premium seating, where you'd be able to come up here to this level, you would access to the club area, high top tables, and you have club seating right here. And same thing with this club over here, club number two, same thing, club seating here as well as here. Uh, support spaces back here for the club area, and then they would have just really a nice elevated atmosphere. So this really adds to the, the seating count itself, so when we talk about 3,000, 3,600, we're picking up some additional seating capacity on this level right here. But what's nice about having suites and clubs is that you're able to have a more variety of experience so you could sell those suites out. It, it, it can become an economic generator for some facilities. Um, in addition to the club space, a premium uh, ticket price as well, which actually, again, more variety of seating. One thing I'll touch on real quick too, going back one, it's not just bowl seating we have here on the concourse level, if you notice, I know it may be hard to see a little bit, but if you notice, we have rail seating on the back side up here, which is right on the concourse. It's a high table, kind of like a stool seating up there that you have. 
we find that these are actually the most popular seats in a hockey facility. People love them. Um, they're easy to get to. You actually have some of the best sight lines to the ice as well. And so when we look at seating here, we try to provide a flexible amount of seating so that there's a variety because that really enhances the game day experience for a lot of people in a different way. Okay. So let's talk about what it's starting to look like a little bit here. What you see here is what we call kind of a white box model. We're not getting into materiality quite yet. We're thinking about it, but we're not there quite yet. What we gotta start looking at is how are the spaces that we're playing on the inside and then how the space on the outside starting to inform the mass of the building, how it's starting to look. And one of the things that we want to do, and you can clearly see where we're still working on it, is we don't want it to be just a box. How do we go back to our design narrative? We talked about the topography, the layering, and how can we use that to help adjust the scale of the building to make it more pedestrian friendly, to make it relate to that topography with maybe some faceted architecture? How do we introduce the glazing aspect to celebrate the views? And so what we're starting to see here along Tejon is the development of this corner in a way that reduces the scale, gives it a little layering, opens up towards campus, celebrate that lobby experience with the plaza that is planned right here. Right now what you're seeing is the existing uh, business right there with Wooglins, which is right there, just for a sense of scale and what we're, what we're looking at here. But what we're trying to do is take that design narrative and utilize that and apply that in a way that helps break that scale down and creates the type of topography we want to see with the building. In addition to, again, celebrating these spaces in a way that makes that lobby a grand feature um, and also supports future retail and other aspects as well, activating Tejon and taking the plaza and maybe coming around there a little bit. As they go around the building to the southwest corner, and so here we can see what we're trying to do in activating Tejon. So looking at this as a possible way of activating with retail team stores here, this is that outdoor patio I mentioned earlier. Here's that kind of multi-purpose room. And so we're really trying to find a way to, to break the scale of the building down where it's not just a box, but we're trying to carve out of it in a way that supports the spaces on the inside, that reacts to the exterior, that finds a way to break the scale down so that as you're a pedestrian walking here, instead of seeing a, a facade that's way up here about 60 feet, you actually have something that's much more intimate. And so that's the goal we're trying to do on all the elevations to make that work. And also making sure we're supporting the program spaces in between and we're addressing some of the landscape and site features out here as well. So as you can see, there's a lot of variables that go into this, a lot of iterations we've got to go through. But that's the goal, and that's why we have that design narrative to begin with, because it, we, it's our backbone. We hold true to that, and we come back to that when we go through all these iterations. Are we, are we doing the right thing here in the sense of place for the hockey program? Are we doing the right thing here in the sense of place for the community? Are we doing the right thing here in the sense of place for connecting to the college and bringing the students in and having this be a place they can uh, activate and participate in? The other... Uh, on the southeast side, the other thing that we're looking at doing is utilizing the building and that corner as a way for a gateway to the campus along Nevada. How can we celebrate that corner so that as you enter the campus from Nevada that supports um, CC in a way that the building could be a part of that, could be a monumental site element of some sort. Again, this is just a preliminary idea, nothing final about that by any means, but the intent behind that though is to celebrate this corner as a gateway piece. And really, as you enter in the college, utilizing this project to help support that. So we're also studying the southeast corner and how to utilize that as well. You know, some thought about something like this is that that could be a great spot on graduation day where people could take a picture. It just becomes one of those tradition things on campus. So there's an opportunity there to take a look at that. You can also see here, too, um, with this iteration of the building, we're looking at a secondary entrance back here. Uh, not as grand as the other one, not as big as the main lobby but this would allow us another point of entry for ticket scanning for security entrance as well for the facility and another point of exiting too as well, which we have to take a, a really good look at how people not only ingress the building, but egress outside the building. This is one of our early shots of the lobby. Again, I, I keep going back to this because this is the first thing you see when you enter the facility. And so it's gotta have a wall factor. It's gotta say something about Tiger Hockey. It's gotta be branded, but it also has to be a space that can be very flexible for the, other, um, for the other activities that we mentioned. So what we're looking at here is an open lobby concept, a grand stair up to concourse level, 
This is at Pro Shop. They'll be back here for ticketing in the team store. Up here is going to be that multi-purpose space that kind of looks the lobby. It's that extension. It makes it accessible. You can see it. I can go there. I can occupy that. A lot of times, especially in our northern climates, hockey arenas are open to the public. A lot of people go in there to do a lot of walking because it's pretty much hazardous for your health to be outside at that point in time. So you go inside and you'll see people up here walking stairs, doing the concourse, walking around there. So having a feature like this that's very inviting is very important to make those successful. And then I think you start seeing too some of the geometry we're playing with here a little bit to make sure that we're integrating what happens on the outside with the inside. It's very important that we have the integration. So looking at some of that facet geometry that relates back to the topography of the site that we see in the mountains and beyond. Some of that layering that we're talking about as well to kind of break this down. So it's a grand space, but it feels like as a human scale that I feel comfortable in that space as well. One of the other interior qualities that we're looking at is going to be the roof structure of the arena itself. Um, one of the classic things you see in old arenas is a lot of wood feature, wood trusses, wood structure. Uh, it's a pretty dynamic, traditional uh, effect with hockey programs, and it's something that I think would be really a grand gesture in this space to do something similar. So what you're seeing here is just an early study on a hybrid type truss system where you'd have some wood features, some metal features with it, maybe some wood decking, a lot of things that we're investigating. But the idea is to really enhance that game day hockey experience. And having something up here that can really do that, I think would be a, a pretty successful move to pull off. A lot of times what you see is this is just painted white and it goes away. Well, how can we do something with that that celebrates that? And it still is not the center of attention, but it just enhances the game day experience. Another thing too I'll point out here is the ribbon board all the way around the arena, the center hung scoreboard. Those are all going to be kind of the audiovisual things we'll be looking at to enhance that experience as well. Um, and how do we keep people engaged throughout the, the, not only the game, but how can that be supported maybe with other events that happen here um, as well, whether it be a lecture series or a small concert to have that AV technology. So that would be also very important. And then also you can see that, that, that rail seat I was talking about right around here. These are great seats. And so that flexibility is kind of, this is the, the vantage point you would see from that as you're watching the game. And also to just point out, there's a club suite levels in the press area. Just kind of get your bearing straight, your orientation straight. So as this is going through the, the college design review committee, one thing that came out of that, which was coming back to one of our project goals, was this idea of, and I've already kind of said it, but I really like the statement that they came up with, is how can athletics do what it needs to do for hockey to compete at the national level, have that recruiting advantage, but at the same time also serve the broader uh, Colorado College and Colorado Spring communities. Again, it's about that sense of place. And the college is thinking about it, we're thinking about it, it's a very important thing. And so what I want to highlight here is the idea that hockey has their sense of place. This is a team suite. The heavily branded area, this recruiting advantage, that's going to be very important as we develop that spatial hockey program. But in addition to what's also going to be important is how do we address other areas of the building. So, that one space I showed you, the multi-purpose space, what we're seeing a trend a lot in higher education, for example, is kind of what they call pop-up spaces. They're very flexible, temporary spaces that can do a lot of different things. And so the idea of a pop-up space here is that you would have an extension off the lobby, as I keep saying, an outdoor component to this, that you could do a variety of activities. On game day, a variety of activities on non-game days. You could do a lot of things with either a classroom function or a lecture series. It could be really anything that you want it to be as long as you kind of program it correctly. <coughs> One of the things that has to be successful about that though is that's gotta be highly visible, highly accessible. Again, it's gotta, you know, I gotta be able to wanna go there. And so that's one of the most important uh, attributes to this is to really celebrate that space. But in addition to functioning as maybe a student athlete's uh, study session or maybe this was a lecture series, I keep saying, so how can the furniture support that? Again, this is something very unique to a hockey facility. We don't see a lot of this, but it has the opportunity to be something extremely successful because on game day, it could be this. Again, that social experience you'd have there on a game day. Or it could be this, an outdoor session of yoga. If there's another program on campus that would like to use that, there's just a lot of functions that could be there. So again, it's trying to create that sense of place for the community, for the college, in addition to the hockey program. So these are one of the ideas that we're looking at with this pop-up space to integrate that into the program, into the design. And then the third goal I mentioned was net zero. 
So right now we're developing a path to net zero, what that means. Um, at a high level, and I'm not gonna be an engineer, so I'm not gonna the specifics of it, but at a high level, the way we do this is that we need to reduce the loads of the building as much as possible. Because that way if we consume less, then we don't have to produce as much. So the things, how we do that, what we look at, really where we start is the envelope. The envelope is the exterior walls. Airtight, heavily insulated, optimized. We need to start there. Glazing, reduce the glazing in certain elevations to make sure that we're not getting too much solar heat gain. So once we start reducing the lows, we look at the other systems, whether it be mechanical, the ice plant, because the ice plant is a huge, it, it's an energy hog, it is. And so we need to address that. Heat recovery from that system, put that back into other areas of the building. How can we do that? Uh, geothermal solutions for uh, not only heat recovery, but also for mechanical speaking. So all those things, we reduce the loads, we optimize the envelope, we look at the mechanical systems to get to a spot, low flow plumbing fixtures, uh, other things for site planning and landscape. And then we get to a point where we can get to a, a, an energy consumption level that is as low as we can get to facility. Then we look at what it takes to produce, usually for solar PVs, that's usually the number one product we look at, to get up to where we consume no more than what we produce. And what we're looking at right now in pr pretty early preliminary designs, and what you see here is a chart of energy, cons energy consumption based off some very similar facility sizes. Uh, here's Honan, which is, you know, 1966. But you can see Honan is definitely an energy hog, which is to be expected. It's an older facility. Uh, a couple of newer projects around the country that are very similar in size to uh, Robeson is going to be Miami University in Ohio, 2006, and Bentley University in Connecticut in 2018 have a couple of facilities. Interesting about Bentley is that's a lead platinum building. And they do got, they did, they did attain that, but you can see where their energy levels are at right now. This is what we're modeling in Robeson. Again, this is preliminary, but this is what we're modeling. And again, that all goes back to everything I just showed you on how we lay this building out, how we uh, work on the envelope, make sure it's airtight, we look at the systems, the PV systems. This is what we're modeling right now. This is gonna fluctuate, this is not final. It's gonna fluctuate as we go through design, but this is the goal. This is the goal to get us down to a lowest possible energy consumption level we can get to so that we can offset that and get to net zero. With that, that ends my presentation. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate your time. Thanks, Adam. Thanks, Adam, uh, for the presentation. What I want to do now is kind of just uh, bring us all, all back and wrap up a uh, uh, portion of the presentation and then move to uh, uh, question and answers. But um, to kind of share with you a little bit of where we're headed uh, for next steps. This is obviously a very uh, simple graph, but it shows the progression uh, that we're on uh, in that we're moving uh, through uh, the, uh, really the planning uh, process and some of the pre-construction activities that are happening out on the site. And we anticipate this, this uh, effort and continue to have uh, meetings really through, uh, through April and then shifting to a formal submittal um, to the city of Colorado Springs. That's part of the required uh, process that it would be ahead of us. Then, of course, uh, construction. And you can see some of our, our target dates there uh, for groundbreaking and, uh, and for construction. So that's that overall uh, a big picture. Uh, the green line, that green bar, uh, that you see here. We'll be moving that along as we go through our process. You can begin to see some of um, that, um, that progress. The other key piece is uh, that where we are today really represents the middle of that planning process. So we have a lot of work ahead of us uh, on our end and we certainly hope you will continue with us as we uh, move forward. Some of the, from a planning perspective, some of the uh, requirements that are yet out ahead of us uh, and that also represent more opportunities uh, for community input and feedback uh, are these series of land use uh, applications. And there really are four of those. Uh, the first and foremost being a conditional use uh, development plan application. And that is really related to the zoning um, that exists on the property today, the form-based zone, and um, our need to, to uh, really be in compliance uh, with that. We also anticipate uh, a, uh, an update to the Colorado College uh, Master Plan, that long-range uh, development plan. 
Uh, the city will be looking for that and asking for that. And then there are two other pieces that uh, are kind of more de very much detail oriented. Uh, the first being an alleyway uh, vacation. And what that really means is there's an existing alleyway uh, corridor that runs north and south through the middle of the block, as many of you know. Uh, for this building position that would stretch across that alley, that alley would need to be officially um, vacated or abandoned. And the city has a formal process that we would need to go through for that. And then finally, uh, the plat process. So um, those of you familiar with the site, um, currently it exists in a variety of different individual uh, properties, uh, different parcels. Uh, the plat process would combine all of those individual lots into one um, single lot uh, for the block. And again, it's kind of technical, but it's one of the uh, required efforts that would be ahead of us. At this point, uh, we are looking at being able to advance the, the planning process uh, to the point we'd be ready to make a submittal in, uh, in late April. I think in a previous slide we had shown, we thought we might be a little earlier than that. We're recognizing we have uh, work ahead of us, so we see that uh, sliding a little bit uh, into April, and I wanted to call that out, make sure you're aware of that. And then subsequent to that, um, when we look at uh, of our public meeting process, we see that uh, extending out as well uh, into April. And then there will be also opportunities for uh, public hearings uh, as we move uh, forward again, uh, ultimately uh, to uh, City Council. So that's the overall process uh, that's ahead of us, and I think that's probably a good way to kind of sum up uh, the presentation portion um, here today. And uh, at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Lisa to uh, lead us through uh, question and answer period. So. Great.